All right. Oh, you guys don't have any compassion at all. <laughs> so the, the art of the trust fall. Uh, it requires a few things. Right? It requires someone to close their eyes. Uh, they fall, and of course, hopefully, it requires someone there to catch them. It also requires them to fall in the correct direction. Have any of you ever done a trust fall? I remember growing up, my father and I, we would do trust falls with each other. It, it didn't matter where we were. Uh, we were at a supermarket, we'd do trust fall. If we were at someone's home, if we were at church, uh, parking lot, we would trust fall everywhere. And we found that it wasn't quite as exciting as it's originally designed. So we kind of changed it up a little bit. We figured it'd be more exciting to do the trust fall if the person catching try to get as low as possible to wait until the very last second to catch the faller. Right? You know, if, if you catch somebody here, that, that's not much of a fall, right? If you bend down and you put your hands just inches off the ground, then things get real exciting. Right? A trust fall requires a few key components. It requires someone to fall. It requires someone there to catch. It requires that they fall in the right, in the correct direction in order to be caught. Have any of you ever participated in the trust fall? Maybe for you this morning, maybe for most, if not all of us this morning, maybe following Jesus Christ feels like a big trust fall. For those of you who have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, maybe it feels like you are taking a trust fall. Maybe it feels like you are stepping off that ledge and you are falling into this realm of uncertainty and you're just hoping, you're just hoping that Jesus will be there to catch you. You're just hoping that at the end of your life, when your life ends, that you would have fallen in the right direction. You would have chosen the right Savior. You would have chosen the correct religion, and that trust fall would have been right. But maybe for some of you this morning, you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ because you have just that question. You ask yourself, what if it's not the right fall? What if it's not the right direction? What if it's not the right Savior? Maybe for some of you this morning, you feel like you have your firm feet firmly planted in where you're at. You have a firm foundation in your work, in your school, in your family, in your career, in all these things, in your accomplishments, and you're not ready to follow Jesus because following Jesus would be that trust fall, taking that step off that ledge, and it would just mess up your whole life. Well, this morning we're going to just look just at that see two things in particular. First, we're going to see that following Jesus is following Jesus. And in fact, following Jesus is not a fall at all. Following Jesus is not falling. And secondly, for those who don't want to wait until you die to find out if you're falling in the right direction, the good news is this. Well, for one... When you die, you will find out for sure whether or not you chose the right way. But the good news is that there's assurance, there's hope, and there's certainty even before you die. Following Jesus is not following all. And secondly, following Jesus, you don't have to wait until you die to have certainty of whom you're following. You can have that certainty each and every day. As a backdrop to the message this morning, I want to just read from Hebrews 11, verse 1. A lot of times we have this idea that faith is this mysterious thing, that faith is something we can't really grasp, it's not tangible, that faith is something that's shaky and it's blind. But let's read what the author of Hebrews says. Now, faith is the assurance of things. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Nowhere in that language is there uncertainty. Nowhere in that language is, is there doubt or fear. 
But the author makes certain to use such strong language as that. Assurance, hope, conviction. There is certainty in having faith in following Jesus. It is conviction, belief that leads to action. A belief that is so firm that it leads to such certain action and outcome. Later on, through chapter 11 of Hebrews, it talks about Abraham. Now certainly, we're not going to know everything that there is to know about God. Now certainly, we're not going to know everything there is to every step of our lives. But Hebrews tells us that Abraham left his homeland not sure of where to go, but he left with the certainty that God would take him to the promised land. When God tasted Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. He did it with certainty, not with blind faith, not blind, but he followed through and was willing to sacrifice his son because he was certain that even if Isaac were to be killed, that God would raise him from the dead to fulfill his promise of raising the nation through Isaac. The faith that you have in Jesus Christ is one that you can ensure and that you can be certain of. Because following Jesus is not falling. In following Jesus, you don't have to wait until you die to know if it is true. But you can have certainty each and every day. This morning, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll be in verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. You can find 1 Corinthians in the New Testament of your Bibles towards the right-hand side. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Keep going. If you see 2 Corinthians, if you see Revelation, you've gone too far. 1 Corinthians, 15th chapter, verses 1 through 11. First Corinthians is written by the Apostle Paul. He is writing to the local church at Corinth. Chapters 1 through 6, Paul tackles the issue of unity. Uh, there's a lot of disunity, disharmony. There's a lot of conflict at the church at Corinth. And so Paul spends six chapters of his letter addressing the issue of restoring unity. In chapters 7 through 16, then he addresses specific issues that are plaguing that local church. Chapter 7 through 16, he addresses issues concerning marriage and divorce. He addresses issues concerning meat that has been sacrificed to idols. He addresses issues concerning idolatry, head coverings, gifts of the Spirit. And then in chapter 15, towards the end of his letter, he seems to wrap it up by really speaking to the heart, the core issue. That the church at Corinth is having all of these issues because they have neglected the very foundation of their faith. In chapter 15, he addresses that many there at the church have rejected the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They've rejected the good news that has been preached to them. And so to restore their faith, to restore their foundation, Paul again preaches the good news to them and to remind them upon which they stand. Following Jesus Christ is not falling into the unknown. It is not going from the certain to the uncertain. So what is it instead? Chapter 15, starting with verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. Again, the language there. It's not in which... You now are uncertain, now which we made you lost. But it's on which you stand. It's the very foundation by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. They have been saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And they are being saved each and every day. 
the progressive sanctification that each and every day of their lives they are being made more and more like Christ. Verse 3, for I deliver to you as of first importance what I also receive. So what is Paul passing down to them? He is passing down the gospel that was passed on to him. The truth that was revealed to him through Jesus Christ, he is now presenting to the church at Corinth. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas, then the twelve, and to many great multitudes. It's important that Paul mentions that Jesus was buried because that's proof that he died. You don't bury a person who's alive. And according to the scriptures, three days later, he rose from the dead. And what is evidence of his resurrection? He presented himself to many, to the apostles, to multitudes. He's risen from the dead. Let's look at verse 3 again. The good news is this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Following Jesus is not abandoning firm ground and falling and losing hope. Christ died for our sins. As humans, each and every one of us, we are all sinners. That sin came through one man, Adam, and we inherited. We are sinners and we are sinning. And we have sinned. We've rebelled. We've turned away from God. We miss his perfect mark. And because we fall short of the glory of God, there's a consequence for our sins. And the consequence is that we are to die. We are to die physically, and we see evidence of that. Each day, we are one step closer to the grave. Each day, I get more tired. I get weaker. I get older. I get sicker. Each day is a day that is closer to my death. And then after dying physically, because of sin, the punishment is then to be in conscious torment, to suffer God's wrath for all eternity. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves because there's nothing we can do to get rid of that which separates us from God, which is sin. No amount of work, no amount of good deeds, no amount of knowledge, no amount of accomplishments can get rid of the sin that hinders us from relationship with God. And because we cannot save ourselves, God made a way through his son, Jesus Christ, who was born, who lived a life without sin in order to become the perfect sacrifice. He became sin who knew no sin to become so that we may become the righteousness of God. Jesus, who was sinless, took our place, our punishment upon the cross so that we may have his righteousness, so that we may be made right with God. No longer enemies of God, but now sons and daughters of God for all who repent and believe in him. And it's an assurance This faith is one that is certain. It is a faith that is sure. It is a faith of conviction, a belief that leads to great action and transformation. For those of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, perhaps this morning you feel and you wonder, was it worth it? You know, you look back and you think, man, my life was a lot simpler then. I had it all figured out, and then I followed Jesus, and now there's all these uncertainties. What do I do with my life? Perhaps for those of you who have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, perhaps you're reluctant or hesitant to follow Jesus because you feel that your feet are firmly planted. And to follow Jesus is to take that fall, that leap into uncertainty. Back in 2016, it sounds like it's a long time ago. Back in 2016, Walmart teamed up with Oreo uh, to come out with an exclusive flavor uh, to be sold at uh, Walmart. 
And so the Oreo cookie, it's two cookies with cream in the middle. And so they came out with a flavor, and when they finally came out with this flavor, they revealed this flavor, and the internet went crazy, and people started heckling them and just making fun of them. Oreo announced back in 2016 that their exclusive flavor that they came up with. So they already had mint Oreos. They already had vanilla Oreos. They already had thin Oreos, double Oreos. They then announced, we have a new flavor of Oreo. Cookies and cream flavored Oreo. One person responded, congratulations, Oreo. You made an Oreo flavored Oreo. (laughs) And in reality... That's just what it was. Cookies and cream flavor, that originated as an ice cream flavor. It was an ice cream flavor that attempted to imitate an Oreo cookie. So in essence, Oreo made the full circle to make an Oreo flavored Oreo. And so people were scratching their heads. An Oreo flavored Oreo, a cookies and cream flavored Oreo is not a new Oreo. A cookies and cream flavored Oreo is the original Oreo. It's the default setting Oreo. Humans who are falling into uncertainty That is not a new flavor of human. Humans who are restless and uncertain and don't have hope, who lack purpose, that is not a new flavor of human. That's human-flavored human, right? Uncertainty and falling and not knowing where you're falling, that's our default setting. That's our default flavor. Because we came as sinners, continuing to sin without hope. Following Jesus Christ is not starting at a place of certainty and stepping off into uncertainty and following Jesus. But rather, following Jesus Christ stops us from the fall. We're all fallen and falling. I encourage you, I pray that the Holy Spirit will convict your heart and your life this morning. That for those of you who have assurance and feel that you're firm because of your earthly accomplishments, I pray that for those of you who feel hope and purpose and assurance because of your work, because of your school, because of your family, hope that you'll realize that that's all sinking sand. That all of those things will fade. None of those things will last. That you're pursuing something that will never be able to satisfy. One day you'll accomplish something and the next day with the same accomplishment you'll feel like a failure needing to accomplish something more. Without Jesus Christ, we are fallen beings who are falling. Taking that step of faith is a step into assurance, a step into hope, a step into certainty. Following Jesus stops us from the fall and is our blessed hope and gives us purpose. Following Jesus Christ is not a trust fall, but it stops us from the fall. Secondly, for those of you who have not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ, perhaps you're not yet ready to because maybe you want something sure. You want something tangible. Maybe for you, you think, the only way I think is, is if I die, then I'll know for sure. And yes, that's true. When you die, you will know for sure. And for those of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, perhaps for you, you are looking for encouragement. Perhaps for you, you are looking for certainty and assurance of the decisions you've made. 
perhaps for those of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, you have or perhaps you're contemplating and thinking about making certain earthly sacrifices and you're wondering, is it going to be worth it? Following Jesus may require you to lose certain relationships. It may require you to be rejected by those who for your whole life you've sought their approval. To follow Jesus, many of you have, many of you may be on the doorstep of letting it go of certain dreams and aspirations that you've been working your whole life for. And maybe you're asking yourself, I'm not that sure. If only I could be sure. Well, the good news, point number two is you don't have to wait until you die to be sure. Verse 5, and that Jesus appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Paul accounts who Jesus appeared to while he was alive, before he ascended to heaven. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some, by the time Paul is writing this letter, to the church at Corinth, have fallen asleep or they have died. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul calls himself, humbly, he calls himself one who is untimely Born, His conversion experience was a lot different than the rest of the apostles. Paul was one who persecuted believers. He was one who was chasing after to kill those who were followers of Jesus. One who was untimely born. One who came to faith. He was on the road to persecute and to kill believers when Jesus appeared, blinded, and gave Paul a new mission and a new purpose for his life, that he would no longer be persecuting and killing Christians, but taking a radical 180 degree turn. And now he would suffer greatly for the gospel. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Man, he worked hard. He went around evangelizing and proclaiming the gospel around to the known world, all around the Mediterranean Sea. He saw his eyes to go to Rome, planting church after church, making disciple after disciple. I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so You believe. Why is Paul so certain, without dying, that Jesus Christ died and rose again? Why does the account that Cephas, that the 12, that James, that the 500 can be sure and certain before they even die? They're certain because they saw and they witnessed Jesus. They're certain because they experience the power of God. They're certain because of the evidence of their faith. Paul is certain that Jesus is who he says he is because Paul is one who is untimely reborn. Paul is certain because he knows for certain who he was before Jesus. And Paul is certain Jesus died and rose again because Paul is certain of who he is after encountering Jesus. Paul is certain even before he dies that Jesus died and rose again because he sees the difference the gospel has made in his life in the lives of believers around him. Whether or not you've seen Star Wars or not, uh, you know 
one of the most popular and, and greatest plot twists in cinema history, right? Leading to one of the greatest cliffhangers. What's going to happen next, right? So episode five, The Empire Strikes Back. You've got the climax at the movie. The climax of the movie. What's happening? You have Darth Vader fighting against Luke Skywalker, right? So if you haven't seen it, you probably heard those names floating around. So a movie and a half leading up to this fight. They built up the backstory. Luke is the good guy. He's fighting for the light side, right? He's the good guy. He's trying to save the galaxy from destruction, from the dark side, from the sky, Darth Vader. This guy is evil, wicked. He's dressed in a tin can. He's a bad dude, all right? And so for a movie and a half, good guy, bad guy, good guy, bad guy. Bad guy wants to destroy the galaxy. Good guy wants to save the galaxy. So inevitably, what's going to have to happen? Good guy is going to have to fight bad guy. But not only that. Obi-Wan, his mentor, told Luke Skywalker that your father was killed by none other than Darth Vader. So at the climax of the fifth movie, Luke is fighting against Darth Vader. So what's on the line here? Luke is trying to save the galaxy. And on the other hand, on one hand, he's trying to avenge his father's death. So they go to an epic battle. The movie's made in the 80s, so they just, you know, they just. As they're fighting, eventually Luke gets his hand chopped off. The hand gets chopped off with the lightsaber, goes down into that pit. He lets out a scream, ah! Armless, Luke Skywalker retreats over a railing, hangs precariously, and then Luke and Darth Vader begin to have a dialogue. Darth Vader prods at Luke. He says to Luke, Obi-Wan never told you about your father. Luke, with disgust, says, he told me enough. He told me you killed him. And then Darth Vader delivers the line of lines, right? He says, no, I am your father. Luke, with the greatest face of disgust, horror, torment, denial, rejection, he says, and I quote, no, that's not true. That's impossible. If any of you here this morning told me, do you know what happened to your father? Yes, he's living in Florida. Why? And you said, no. I am your father. I would have similar reaction. I would tell you, no, that's not true. That's impossible. Luke, looking at the guy who just chopped off his hand, Luke, looking at the guy who wants to destroy the galaxy, he looks at the evidence, he says, no, that's not true, that's impossible. If any of you told me, did Obi-Wan tell you about your mother? No, I, he doesn't have to tell me. I know my mother is living in Florida. No, I am your mother. I would tell you the same thing. No, that's not true. That's impossible. If any of you here this morning, aside from Nellie, told me I am your wife, I would tell you no, that is not true. That is impossible. If you went up to somebody, a friend, a family member, an acquaintance. If you went up to somebody here at PCAC and you told them, I'm a Christian, and you told them, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, you told them, I believe that Jesus died and rose again, would their response be in horror? No. That's not true. That's impossible. Told me, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And they're looking at the evidence of your life, your words, your actions. They're looking at your dreams, your aspirations. They're looking at your goals. 
They're looking at all the things that you're living for, that you're striving for. But they look back at you and say, no. Look at your life. That's not true. No. Look at your life. That's impossible. We don't have to wait until we die to know whether or not the gospel is true. We don't have to wait until we die to know whether or not Jesus truly rose from the grave. How can we know even before that? We can know for certain based on the lives of followers of Jesus Christ. We can know for certain, based on the lives of those who profess to be Christians, for those who proclaim that Jesus died and rose again. How? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. My prayer is that based on your commitments, based on your priorities, based on your speech, based on your actions, based on your life, based on the things that you're working and striving for, based on your desires and your dreams, when you go and you tell somebody, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, they're not going to say, no, that's impossible. But when you give a defense, when you give an explanation, a reason for the hope that you have, They'll then say, yeah, that makes sense. They'll look at the evidence and they'll see that it's real and they say, hey, you know, it all adds up. No wonder you have a different purpose. No wonder you have a greater hope. No wonder it all makes sense now. I know with certainty that Jesus died and rose again. I know that God is faithful and what he's promised will be true. And I don't have to wait until I die to find out. When I look back at my life as a child, as as a teenager, even in college, I was always unhappy and unsatisfied every step of the way. My parents would show me pictures of us on vacation. Oh, here we are at Disney World. Look at me. I've got this huge frown on my face, right? I want to get to the gift shop. They won't let me buy anything. Right? So I'm just going to pout the whole trip. Right? Then in middle school, we go to St. Augustine to the oldest fort in the United States. And there I am pouting because I'm on this miserable trip. And I think about my life. Every step of the way, I was always, always miserable. I was always asking, always desiring for something else. Mom, Dad, can't you give me something more? And once I got that more, I became even more dissatisfied. I thought about everything else I was lacking, everything else I didn't have. Man, going through school, it's fine. I could do the work. I could get whatever grades I need, C's, get degrees, right? I could do that. But I didn't have a purpose. I didn't have a rhyme or reason to do what I was doing. without purpose, without hope, disgruntled, unsatisfied. That was my life before I surrendered to Jesus Christ. Now after, there's still struggles. There's still hurdles to climb and to get over. There's still sickness. There's still temptations, but the difference is this. In Jesus Christ, Jesus has given me a hope and a purpose that I've never had before. Jesus has given me joy that I've never known. I'm so excited to be able to be here at PCAC. I've never been excited about anything in my life. I'm so excited to get to serve and to be alongside each and every one of you. I've never been excited to be around anybody before. 
I know for certain that Jesus died and rose again. I don't have to wait until I die. Because I know for certain I was purposeless and miserable before Jesus. And I know for certain now I have a purpose and now I have a joy. For those of you who have not yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ, perhaps you're unsure. Is it worth it? Is it real? Is it true? If you have any doubts, if you have any questions, if it's true, if it's real, I encourage you, please, after the service, come and talk to me. I encourage you, if you have any questions, whether it's real or true, talk to any of the other believers here. Anybody else here that not just proclaims to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but perhaps you've been watching, you've been looking, and you notice that there's something different about them, that they do have hope, that they do have purpose. I encourage you to approach them and to ask them gently, is Jesus real? How do you know? And I ask and invite and I pray that you would know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior for yourself. Taking a trust fall requires someone to fall, requires falling in the right direction, and requires someone there to catch. The good news begins with bad news. And the bad news is as humans, we're all falling to begin with. We're all falling, and we can't stop ourselves from falling. We can't catch ourselves. But the good news is that there is one who can. That Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus is the one who gives hope and purpose. A new life to live today, tomorrow, each and every day. And a new hope for all eternity. If you would, please stand and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you as humans, as limited beings with limited capacity, with limited ability, and as humans, we are sinners who keep on sinning, who are unable to save ourselves. I ask that the Holy Spirit would convict us of sin and righteousness. To open our eyes to see that we are in need of a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. If you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, and you're wondering, is it worth it? Is it real? I pray that you examine your life and see that the world that we live in, that the best that the world can provide is hopelessness, is lostness. The best the world can give us is more worries, more concerns, more temptations, <clears throat> more suffering and more strife. That we are already falling it's Jesus Christ, our Savior, who stops us from falling. And perhaps this morning, <coughs> you're wondering if it's real or not. Perhaps you've already placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And you're wondering, was it worth it? Is it worth it? Should I continue to follow him? If there's decisions that you are making or will make, Worldly things that you're going to surrender and give up, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be tough. And you're wondering, should I give those things up? Is it real? Is this Jesus real? 
I pray that you be encouraged to know that yes, it is real. And yes, you don't have to wait until you die to find out. That you see that Jesus died and rose again, the real power of the Holy Spirit each and every day in your life. Each and every day in the life of the church. If you do not know Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, may you repent and believe in him so that you may be saved. And then, Father, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.